Okay, it's time to start the last talk of today. So if you are ready, Martin. Okay, we're happy to have Martin Hidding here who will talk about algorithmic study of elliptic modular graph forms. So please go ahead. Okay, so firstly, do you hear me? Is the, uh, is the microphone on? I think I just uh, flipped the mute switch, but doesn't, is it? Hmm, let's see. Yeah, it's, on. It's, on. it's on yeah okay very good uh yeah so i will be talking so well my 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 talk is titled the algorithmic study of elliptic modular graph forms and it's based on uh a paper which uh, just today um, arrived on the archive which uh, we uh, i wrote in collaboration with oliver sutter and kong verbeek so here's the archive number the paper is named slightly different than uh, the title of my talk because I wanted to focus a bit more on some algorithmic aspects of the paper. Um, but on the whole, this is a paper on the study of yeah these special functions called elliptic modular graph forms and how you can find relations between these functions in a systematic manner. So I wanted to start off by just giving a quick summary of the talk. So, you know, uh, as it goes on where we are, so in the beginning, I will just give some basic properties of the EMGFs and the basic definitions. To some, this may already be familiar and maybe to others they haven't seen it. So um, that's why I will just go through that. And then I will talk about iterated integrals. And these will be very similar iterated integrals uh, as the ones that appeared in uh, Bram van Beek's talk. But now there will be some additional dependence on some punctures. So the integrals, look like this. I apologize if this is a bit small. I can I can write a bit uh, a bit larger. Um, so they are labeled uh, as beta SV and there's some some labels J, K and, and Z. But uh, what this is, I will talk about uh, in a bit. Then um, the third part of the talk will be about the so-called sieve algorithm for EMGFs. And what this algorithm does for you is that it is an automated way to rewrite EMGFs uh, in terms of these functions, these uh, beta SV, which are these, uh, these iterated integrals. And the idea will be that uh, if we do this um, conversion, that these iterated integrals um, very manifestly show all the relations that exist uh, between these functions. Um, all right, and then in the last part, um, so I hope I'm, I'm writing uh, large enough now. So I will talk uh, a bit about a Mathematica package, which I will showcase on my laptop, which is called EMGF tools. And that's, I guess, the most algorithmic aspect of this talk. And what it does is it fully automates this conversion into beta SV, and then allows you to do various algebraic uh, manipulations on EMGFs and to count them and, and things like that. So, um, all right, so maybe I'll move to the larger board. So first I want to give some, some context about the function space in which, um, well, the, the, the physics context in which these functions appear. And again, I will here uh, repeat a little table, which um, was also on Bram's talk and slightly extended. So the idea is that if you look at string amplitudes, you can look at open and closed string amplitudes, and then you can look at amplitudes of a particular genus G. So if you're in the open string, uh, a genus zero, you just have uh, the disk. And it turns out that uh, the, the functions which you see there are the multiple zeta values. And furthermore, uh, if you go to the closed string, then you end up on the sphere with some additional punctures. And here it turns out that you find uh, particular functions which are single valued multiple zeta values. So in this case, they're just numbers. Now, once you go to genus, uh, genus one, things become a bit more complicated. So the topology becomes now that of uh, a cylinder in the open string case. And you see so-called um, elliptic multiple zeta values. And, and these, um, these are elliptic uh, generalizations of these, which depend on an additional parameter tau that um, parameterizes the geometry. 
And so if you see it like this, you would expect that once you go now to the closed string genus one, now what you would see is single valued elliptic multiple zeta values. But actually the way that we solve this is in terms of these functions called MGFs. So modular graph uh, forms or functions. And they can be loosely thought of as a kind of single valued instance of elliptic uh, multiple zeta values. And now where I will extend this graph slightly is that we also consider genus two, but we pinch one of the, the A cycles and we consider this non-separating uh, degeneration, which lends you back on a torus. But now there's some additional, uh, additional points which are uh, identified. So we can call one PA and PB. And then we kind of have by translation invariance, some, some additional puncture Z, which is the difference of the two. And so it, once you start studying uh, the functions here, then you end up in the language of the elliptic modular graph forms. And very loosely, they can be thought of as a kind of single valued elliptic multiple polylogarithms. So um, yeah, so this is just a, a quick motivation, both from a physics perspective and maybe from a math perspective as to why you would be interested in, uh, in looking at these functions. Now, so next I will start to write down some of the basic definitions. And one of the, um, the first incarnations of a elliptic modular graph form is the so-called um, Zagier uh, elliptic uh, polylogarithm. And I will write it down in a slightly different uh, normalization than it usually appears. So the function we're interested in is denoted D plus, and it depends on a puncture and on tau, and it has some integer indices. And then it gets defined in the following way. There is some normalization factor in tau and uh, a convenient pi. Then we're taking a lattice sum um, of the following. So this function looks as follows. And as a reference, I cite the year 1919, it's okay. Right, so this is the, the first incarnation of an elliptic modular graph form. And now um, the question is, what does this notation mean? So firstly, I'll be working in so-called co-moving coordinates, which means that you parameterize uh, the function Z as U to R plus V. Um, and this essentially lives on the lattice parameterization uh, of the torus. Then furthermore, you have discrete momenta P, which are equal m tau plus n, where m and n are integers. And then lastly, this uh, lambda prime, it just indicates a lattice. So you could think of it, um, sorry, it should be tau. So you can think of it as a lattice, but we're excluding the point zero so that, well, we're not, we're not summing here over, uh, over a pole. So, so that's the basic function. And then there's some various special uh, cases of that. So firstly, if you set, say, the anti-holomorphic index to zero, you get up to a proportionality constant, um, a particular kernel called FK. Um, so that works out as follows. And well, for the people who are familiar with this, these Fs uh, also appear uh, if, if you do a Laurent expansion of a so-called kronecker eisenstein series. But uh, for the purposes of this talk, we can just think of it as a special case of this, this D plus. Then another basic definition would be when you set the two indices to be equal. And typically we denote this by G as follows. Now, another thing I should mention is that this sum, it absolutely converges when a plus b uh, greater or equal than three.
And typically, uh, I will stick to this case and also for the generalizations that we'll be looking at. Um, when a plus b equal two, things become conditionally convergent, but uh, you can still define it. And then you get a G1, which ends up being the uh, Green's function uh, on the torus. Now, um, in addition, it's useful to mention that if you put Z to zero, you end up in a language that we're familiar with from before. So for example, we have that in the case where G is zero, we just get um, this here where this G is just a holomorphic Eisenstein series. So it would just be a sum over lambda of uh, one over P to the A. And, and similarly, if you do that in the case where the two variables are equal, and again, you set the Z to zero, then uh, you end up with uh, this non-holomorphic Eisenstein series, which um, in this case, uh, let's see, I think is also defined with this normalization factor. And again, we're summing over this lattice. Uh, and now we have the following summon. Okay, and what is clear here is that when Z is zero is that, yeah, you get these Eisenstein series. So clearly these functions have some kind of uh, modular properties. And in particular, they're non-holomorphic modular forms. So this D plus in general of AB, if you transform the Z and tau arguments in the following way. So just a standard modular transformation where, I'm sorry, this is a bit small, where you have the usual matrix in SL2. Um, then this transforms with an anti-holomorphic factor, the following form times the original function. And maybe to be consistent, I should for the vertical bar here. So what you would say is this is a non-holomorphic modular form of weights zero and B minus A, because there's only this anti-holomorphic uh, prefactor after the transformation. Uh, and the idea here is that we actually chose that to be the case in the normalization here, because there's this in tau factor and in tau by itself is a non-holomorphic modular form of weight minus one comma minus one. So clearly, if you if you multiply by that, you can always choose to put either one of these two to zero. Sorry. Okay. Um, so I will move on to the next board, and now give you the more general functions. But before I do so, maybe I should just give some more references. So these, um, these, these functions, uh, among others, appeared in papers by uh, Doker, uh, Green, and Pielin. And I'm also basing a lot of this beginning of the talk on um, a paper by Kleinschmidt, um, Slaughterer, And Docker. All right, so um, now we generalize these functions and we introduce a new notation, namely C plus. And I hope this is still readable, uh, this board. So we have this C plus function. Yeah, so the, the plus at this, um, it just stands for the fact that we chose to get rid of the holomorphic uh, modular weight and only have an anti-holomorphic one in the, yeah. And the minus, you could define a C minus and you would just add a different factor of in tau such that you would absorb this and then you would get the weight A minus B comma zero. Okay. 
Okay, so there's there's many many definitions. Um, at the beginning of this talk, just a set of conventions. So, if we generalize this d plus, we can do that in the following way. We introduce a momentum conserving delta function, and for the rest, we have a similar product to before. There's some exponential um, nu minus mv, but now everything is labeled. And again, we have the discrete momenta like such. Now, you, you can kind of see that the d plus was a special case of this, but what is different is that we have this, um, this delta function in there. And, and the reason is this is actually a dihedral EMGF. And you can also consider more general topologies, graph topologies associated with these functions. And essentially that dictates for you where the delta functions are. But uh, in this talk, I will only discuss this dihedral case, which is given here. And then, um, we have the special identity that if you have generically um, a two column C plus, it can be written as a D plus under the following rule. So that shows that um, really the D plus is a special case of this of this C plus. Absolutely, sorry about that. Yes, so what I should clarify, and it's already clear from here is that in general, this ABZ will always um, be a matrix of these integer exponents and also of the functures. And to be consistent, I will use a capital R for the last row. Okay, so now um, to, to continue this talk, um, what I will do is I will write down a few basic identities that will come up later when we start rewriting these objects in terms of iterated integrals. And then we start actually performing this sequel deceive algorithm, which allows for a systematic study of these functions. So I'll just stay here and fill the last words um, and give you, give you a few of these identities. So one that will be particularly useful is called uh, the momentum conservation identity. And it's a very simple identity that tells us that if we are summing over columns and we choose to subtract a unit factor in the rth direction, which here I denoted by SR, that this is just zero. And we can do that on either of the two rows. So what you get is as follows, equals zero. Um, and the way that uh, you could easily prove this is by looking at the definition at the top and um, taking the factor that's in the delta function, so the sum of all the p's, and just plugging it into the numerator. And then this thing by itself has to equal zero. But of course, if you expand it out, it has the exact effect of lowering all the exponents by, by, uh, by one. Another identity that will show up is the so-called factorization identity. And what it tells us is that we can um, strip off a column which has only zeros. So if we have something of the following form, where now one column is completely zero. Oh, and I should say, I'm sometimes a bit sloppy and I will forget to write the tau arguments, but it's always understood that all these C pluses depend on the tau. 
So to come back, this factorization identity tells us that we can write this as a product of D pluses. minus a similar EMGF, but here we have stripped off a column. Now, these two identities will be very useful because uh, what we will do is work with derivative operators, which I will write down in a bit. And these derivative operators have the uh, effect that they will lower these exponents. And so when the exponents are lowered, um, you uh, eventually start introducing zeros, which will allow you to uh, apply identities like this. Now there's one final identity, which um, needs to be mentioned, which is the holomorphic subgraph reduction, which I have uh, uh, given a shorthand uh, for here. And essentially it tells you that if you have a C plus, where now there are two zeros, and if you if you draw a graph, at least for an MGF, um, these two zeros would indicate that you have a holomorphic subgraph, but we can just think about uh, having two zeros here. And then we have some additional columns on the right that this simplifies in a particular manner that is unfortunately a bit long to write out, but I'll do my best to be quick. So there is uh, this term over here. And what you see here is that um, globally where we are writing things in terms of a product which now have less columns. So in, in effect, we are, we are simplifying the expression. Then there's an additional term with some binomial prefactor. Which looks like this. And I have one more term to write down, or actually a few more, but they're given from a permutation. So there is this one. And I apologize if this is a bit small, but the, um, the, the global behavior of this procedure is what's most important. And then this gets multiplied by C plus. Um, so A0 is the sum of A1 plus A2. Yeah, sorry, I was going to mention that. And then here, this is C plus A0 minus K, 0 is E2, ABC. So this gets multiplied together. And then finally, this whole term, you would have to add it once more but flipping A1 and A2. Um, okay, but what's really important about, what's mainly important about this identity is just that you see that you, you're kind of factorizing things in a way where the EMGFs that uh, are appearing on the right-hand side are simplified. So, so that's, that's that. Okay, and since the general formula was a bit involved, and in fact, it also has some subtleties when uh, Z1 and Z2 become coincident, which I've glossed over here. Uh, but since the general formula is a bit involved, let me just give one example, which is a bit more digestible. So for example, let's say that we have the following differences of EMGFs. then this simplifies to a sum of products of D pluses, which is clearly easier to handle than what we saw before. So 
sorry, this should be a product. Two, one, Z, tau, and a third contribution, D plus, four, one, C, tau. And what you see here is that uh, the total sum of the upper and middle rows is uh, the same as what we had on the left. So the main algorithm that we're going to be interested in is essentially to take derivatives and make sure that we get uh, zeros in one of the rows and then to simplify things uh, further. So that leads me to the next part. I'll just check the time. Um, when, until when do I have exactly? Half an hour left. Okay, I think that's uh, that's fine. Right. So now I will talk about iterated integrals and derivatives. And this will lead up to um, the SEEP algorithm. So the idea is that when we're in the lattice sum representation, it is very easy to take derivatives. We know exactly how to do this. So here um, we're looking at a differential operator uh, delta tau, which uh, is defined as two i uh, in tau squared times partial tau. So it's just a partial tau with some additional normalization. And when we act with this on this, uh, this lattice sum representation, uh, it turns out that all we're doing is just shifting exponents around. So that looks as follows. So uh, we take a, a tau derivative and, and globally we are adding exponents on the first row and we're uh, dropping exponents on the second row. And this will exactly tie into the previous story because this um, will eventually create zeros for us if we take enough derivatives. Now, similarly, um, we also understand the Z derivative. So the Z derivative is as follows. We again, we are again summing over uh, over all the columns, but now we're just lowering entries in the second row. Um, and so it looks like this. And I think what I forgot to write down in my notes is that there has to be a DZR, DZ in here, but. Um, but yeah, so this is the this is the global behavior of the Z derivative. So it's also again just lowering uh, lowering entries in this MGF. Now, this will be very nice uh, to to tie this into iterated integrals. So let's uh huh. Uh, whether I keep Z or the cone move. Yeah, so when you take the tau derivative, you would keep U and V to be constant. Um, yeah. And uh, M and M, M and N to be fixed, I guess. Yeah, yeah. so U and V constant. Um, let's see how to continue. So I'll, I'll move back to the to the main board. So next, I plan to write down schematically this class of beta SV functions. And in particular, I will write down the derivative of these functions. And the idea will then be to take derivatives of MGFs in the lattice sum formulation, and then to integrate back up in the beta SV representation, which 
is considerably easier and exposes uh, all the relations. So we have these functions beta SV, and they satisfy a particular holomorphic derivative, which is given as follows. J1 to JL, K1 to KL, C1 to ZL becomes, again, we're summing over columns. That seems to be a repeating theme. Then there's a prefactor ki minus ji minus two and some new beta sv for which we are adding entries in the top row. While keeping everything else untouched. And then there's an additional term with a delta function, um, which looks as follows. And I'll globally explain what this does in a bit. Here, we strip off the last column from the beta SV. Okay, so globally this derivative, so in some sense, these functions are derived through this holomorphic uh, derivative. And it's made in such a way that these J entries are never larger than K minus two. And when they are, this, this prefactor will vanish. And furthermore, if the rightmost uh, column ends up be, uh, being greater than k minus two, you strip off an f kernel. Now, this will be very nice because the differential equation of these beta SVs is very suitable for integration. Uh, because in particular, um, if you look at the global behavior, you'll see that if you have an integrand with an f times a beta SV, you know that this must come from a beta SV with a column appended to the right. And similarly, if you have a, um, if you don't have an F kernel, you start considering elements in an ansatz where you're lowering entries on the top row. And so given the combinations of beta SVs and you're asking what is a primitive, you write down a general uh, linear combination of things that could possibly contribute to that primitive. You take the derivative and then you solve for the, for the coefficients. Now to just not leave you completely out of the loop on what these beta SVs are, uh, I will write down first the definition at uh, depth one and also the definition at depth two. And they're just straightforward generalizations of uh, what we saw already in, in uh, the talk by Ron Fugeek. So First, we need to define some integration kernels, which will be denoted by omega plus minus. And the first one is a kind of holomorphic kernel, which looks as follows. So there's uh, the d tau one, then there's some vector here. And then there's an F. And if you would put Z to zero, this F would turn into a holomorphic Eisenstein series. And you would uh, kind of end up in the, in the case that was already discussed um, in the earlier talk. Now the omega minus is very similar, but now we just have to sprinkle some bars uh, everywhere. So it's essentially like taking a complex conjugate so there's gonna be an overall minus here. We're gonna be having d tau one bar. And similarly, all these factors get some bars sprinkled.
So this is one J F K Z tau one. All right. Um, now that we have given this, we can luckily write down the beta SVs in slightly shorter notation. So first we do that one. And that one is just equal to the following. We're integrating from the cusp to tau. And for the experts on these topics, we're using the tangential base point regularization prescription. Uh, in the case of logarithmic singularities to make sense of that. Okay, and then there's a second term, which is kind of the complex conjugate of the first one. So now there's an omega minus. And things look as follows. So so why did I, I write this down in, in, uh, in detail? It's, it's just that you see that um, these iterated integrals are iterated integrals in tau. They are iter um, integrals over FK kernels and they consist of particular um, holomorphic and, um, and uh, anti-holomorphic combinations of, uh, yeah, of these integrals. And now you might ask, what does this single valued uh, superscript mean? And in this case, it's that the construction of these beta SVs very closely mimics the construction of a single valued um, integrals in the genus one case where you would have a GSV. But I do not claim that these functions are maybe fully single valued. For example, if you take an S transformation, they behave mod modularly at a leading weight, but there are also some lower depth uh, pollutions. Okay, so I'm wondering in view of time if I should write down the depth two case. You say I have 20 minutes, right? Yeah. Is that the maximum or is that the... Yeah, uh, yeah so we have to be uh, for lunch. But we have to... Yeah, I don't mean to go over time. I just meant if there's time for, for, for questions afterwards. Um, okay, so then I think I have some time still to, to write this out. So at that two, we again see some combination of holomorphic and anti-holomorphic terms. And now I use an additional shorthand to make everyone's life a bit easier. So essentially we have one term that has purely holomorphic parts, then there's a holomorphic tension, anti-holomorphic term, and then there's a term which is uh, which has only um, anti-holomorphic uh, contributions. And then in addition, there's some term K or kappa, which is indexed in the same way. And this term is undetermined. I will say a bit more about it first, but I just want to point out that this omega plus minus with say uh, a superscript, those are just the kernels we saw before. So that's just um, where I labeled J, K and Z uh, with um, a P variable just to just to not have to write down this full this full kernel yeah so what's very common in these constructions of single valued um, iterated integrals is that you will give one derivative so you will impose a holomorphic derivative say but then there's some unknowns about the anti-holomorphic part and in this case these functions initially have some uh, some term here which is anti-holomorphic it's T invariant and it vanishes uh, as you go to the cusp, um, but it's initially undetermined. However, um, once we get into the next part where we start rewriting EMGFs in terms of beta SV, then we can actually determine what these Ks are. 
because the reality properties of the EMGFs are very easy to see from the lattice sum formulation, whereas um, uh, it is not so clear at the beta SV level, yeah, what the reality properties of these of these things are. So, all right. So now, um, take the next board. and get to the main algorithmic part. Which is the sieve algorithm. And this will work as follows. So, We start from a lattice sum or an MGF, I should say, that looks as follows. And now our intent is to write this in terms of beta SVs. So it will look roughly like this. We're summing over some words of columns. And then there's this term chi, which will be a prefactor that depends on U and Y. It will be a Laurent polynomial in Y and a polynomial in U. Um, and it will multiply some beta SV where we plug in the words that we're summing over. And then on top of that, there will be some unknowns. There will be, uh, which will determine. So there will be a CU, which will be a term that purely depends on U and a term C0 that only, uh, that doesn't depend on anything, which is a constant. And essentially by taking derivatives, we want to, determine all these terms one by one. So the idea will be as follows. We start by taking a tau derivative. And as we saw before, that just gives us the following. And now, as you see here, you're generating some zeros in your lattice sum. And we start applying these basic simplification identities whenever applicable. If they're not, we're just going to repeat this procedure. So it's purely, purely uh, recursive. So we do that. And now we can kind of assume by induction that we actually know completely what the beta SV representation is of whatever comes out of the derivative. So now I have some uh, chi tilde. And we're summing again over, over words uh, of, of columns of these arguments. And then what we simply do is we integrate that because we saw what the, uh, we saw what the tau derivative of the beta SV is, and we know how to write an ansatz for that. So we compute a primitive from an ansatz. And this completely determines this part. But then there are still these undetermined contributions here. So to determine CU, we can do the following. We, um, we go to the cusp. So let's say we go to tau infinity. And furthermore, we take a Z derivative. Now, like before, we know how the Z derivative acts and it simplifies things. So that will allow us to get a beta SV representation for the Z derivative. Furthermore, as we go to the cusp, what comes out is a polynomial in u and y plus some terms which we ignore which are of order q to the u and q bar to the u and these we can easily integrate since um, essentially this dz it just becomes a du a partial in u so you just integrate in u and that allows you to fix cu uh, and then the remaining part that is left is how to get this c0 out of it so I would have to draw another arrow, which just about fits. And this arrow goes to CU. And the idea here is that, again, we, we go to tau. Um, so we go at tau goes to I infinity. But now, in addition, we take the limit where Z goes to zero. So what that actually gives for us is the following. is just the EMGF 
oh, sorry, the MGF that's associated with the EMGF. And in particular, there's a very nice mathematical package developed by Jan Gerken, which is called modular graph forms. And it's available together with, an, uh, with a paper on the archive. And here, all the modular graph forms were studied up to weight 12 and their Larn polynomials. So we simply make use of this package to match our results. And then we determine C0 and CU. So we have everything. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, we thought about that and the answer is no. Whether I'd be able to give you again the derivation on the board, I'm not sure, but the, the, there is no issue. But the, that's, a, that's a good question. So yes, we are differentiating and integrating at the cusp and finding that this commutes. Okay, so this is the, the last part that I wanted to do on the blackboard. Uh, we've seen now the main ingredients. So we've seen the definitions of EMGS. We've seen some basic relations and we've seen the sieve algorithm. And now I will show how this allows us to um, find yeah, particular non-trivial simplifications. Yeah, so it's not the slides. I want to do this in Mathematica. The slides are for backup. Right, so I think if I share okay. this one, it should be okay. Yeah, so this is a bit messy. Let me remove some of the outputs. Yeah, so since I'm in an in a audience of uh, many mathematicians, I assume not everyone is very well first in Mathematica. Uh, in that case, um, I'll just say that, um, just look at the output cells or in the comments. So the comments tell us what is going on and the output cells tell us the results. Um, but I've also shown the functions of this Mathematica package that explicitly yeah, show, show us what we're doing. So in this example, which I prepared, um, there is a particular C plus, which is still a fairly simple one. It's a three column uh, EMGF. And let's say that we want to rewrite this in terms of beta SVs exactly using this procedure, which I outlined on the board. So if we, um, yeah, if we follow the arrows, which are unfortunately hidden behind this first board, then we would know that the first thing to do would be to take a tau derivative. So in the EMGF tools package currently, that's called del tau. And when we do these two slashes, we're just applying this, this function to the C plus that we had. And what comes out is, is this. So this sum of these two terms is just uh, directly coming from this formula, which I wrote down where you're lowering entries on the second row. Now, what you see here, this is a minus one, but we can uh, resolve this minus one by making use of a momentum conservation identity. And that will give two more terms here, both which have two zeros in the second row. So in the end, you get three terms, which all are um, for, for which uh, holomorphic subgraph reduction is applicable. And you write that out and you find this expression over here. So you find that everything simplifies to D plus and some F times D plus for the derivative. Now, what's really nice, and um, this uh, I didn't immediately write down on the board, there's a closed formula for the D plus in terms of depth one beta SV. So if you're interested, I can write it down, but for now you can um, just get, um, take it as given. And then if you apply that formula, you find that the derivative uh, evaluates to these combinations of beta SV. So you see that um, there's a function that does that uh, and that gives you the output. Now, uh, furthermore, you can start integrating that using an ansatz. So here's a function that's called um, ansatz integrate, which is, sorry, which is over here. And all that does is it writes a suitable ansatz of beta SV functions such that you can match onto this integrand. So you integrate and you find this, but now there's this CU and for convenience, there's also uh, a C uh, not a C zero, but I've, uh, I've absorbed it into the CU here. All right, so that's the first part. Then um, now we start looking at the Z derivative. Or in this case, we actually look at the Z bar derivative, which works just as well. 
And if you apply that, you find that your original lattice sum simplifies because there's now an additional zero in the top, whereas there was already a zero in the second row. And that means you can apply factorization and just immediately write this out in terms of things you know. So here there's the Green's function, and then here there's the non-holomorphic uh, Eisenstein series uh, E2. Then uh, in the next step, we start going to the cusp. So we, we uh, keep only terms up to the order Q U and Q bar to the U. And as you see, here's exactly that polynomial in U and Y, which I wrote down on the board, where B2 is just a balloony polynomial. So this just, this just expands out into rational numbers times uh, powers of U. And so you can easily find a primitive, which you do here. And the crux of it all is that, um, so maybe I should scroll up a bit. We have now two things to compare, um, right? So we have two things to compare. We, on the one hand, we know this. And on the other hand, we know that up to some constant factor at the cusp, uh, the uh, Laurent polynomial should look as follows. So if you, if you compare the two and take the difference, you can solve for what this CU should be. And you find this solution over here. So, so far we have then found the following expression where the only thing that's undetermined is a C0. And it turns out that here we don't ev even need to make use of any external package because, well, the, um, the EMGF that we started from it has alt a plus b, so it's equal to five. And when you start considering the corresponding MGF, it just vanishes because alt MGFs vanish. So in particular, it also vanishes at the cusp. So what you do is you take the expression that we found and you just get uh, an associated uh, would-be Laurent polynomial of the uh, MGF. And we find that this whole contribution already goes to zero by itself. So if you solve things, you just find that C zero is zero and you find the uh, final expression, which is over here. Now, um, okay, so in this example, we did everything manually and we would like to do things automatically. Uh, so I have a few more minutes and I just quickly want to show that, of course, you don't need to, to do all these steps manually. So here, there is uh, this function EMGF to beta SV, and it's applied to this, this, uh, this uh, lattice sum, this EMGF of weight 12, and already applied it because it takes a bit over a minute to run. And I think we saw in one of the previous talks that with Zoom running, it can take a bit longer. And what it does, what it does is it just starts recursively going through all the C pluses that it needs to determine up until it finds the one that it wants. Sometimes it has some issue with conditionally convergent sums and it gives a warning, but this is not, this is not a problem at all because then it will find another uh, path to do it. And you see that, yeah, you can find these really big expressions completely automatically. And um, here, this is all truncated. So this, this icon indicates there's another 232 terms, but that's just to show that you can do it. Then I also want to quickly show that, for example, uh, all these beta SV can be numerically evaluated. And this is also a very nice way to cross-check um, everything. So the idea is that we can write down QQ bar expansions for the beta SV and um, then explicitly plug in the values for U and V, so for Z. So for example, here in these co-moving coordinates, we pick Z to be one third tau plus three quarters. And we pick um, Q to be as follows. And then there's a Q evaluate function and it just evaluates these functions for you and it gives you this number. Uh, okay, and here's the, the C plus that we, were, that we were interested in. So in this case, a three column one. Now, the nice thing is we know exactly at the lattice sum level uh, how conjugates act, but on the beta SV level, it's much more complicated. So you see that there's lots of beta SV in this expression when you take the, the conjugate. Uh, but in fact, when you evaluate it, you see that exactly numerically you get to, uh, you, you get what you expect. So um, yeah, really that's, uh, I, I think then uh, the natural conclusion of my talk. So I just, I just conclude by saying that these algorithms are um, 
implemented uh, up to four dihedral EMGFs. And in the case now currently with a single puncture, although we think extensions are, are possible where you have multiple Z1, Z2. Um, and yeah, so this is up to, up to weight A plus B is 10 and um, perhaps to be continued to, to even higher weights. So uh, yeah, thank you very much, that's all. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Well, I guess it's not exactly related to including Z, but uh, did, did you try to see which kind of combination of this single valued function uh, I've evaluated that Z equals zero appear in the four gravitons scattering amplitude in type 2B, if, if they are a particularly nice combination or if it's just the most general thing they can appear with all ugly. Uh, yeah, well, that's, that's a good question, but personally, I have not uh, really focused on that. So I've, I've been purely looking at generating functions of, uh, of the string amplitudes and then the function space and really just studying this function space by itself. So if you're asking, are there some particularly nice combinations that appear? I unfortunately don't have a good answer. Okay, maybe we can postpone further questions for lunch. So let's thank Martin again. So it would be good if we can hustle to Churchill for lunch, because otherwise they will be angry with us. So I remind you that uh, tonight is the conference dinner at Murray Edwards, starts at 7.30. Don't worry about the dress code, come as you are. <laughs> okay. <laughs>